that i would like to invite dr n p singh the director of indian institute of pulse research kanpur and dr n p singh he is an accomplished agricultural scientist in the area of pulse research he is a great friend and excellent collaborator for us we have led several projects together and i think these all these projects during last 10 years or so what we have worked together they delivered high quality knowledge published several papers in top class journals including nature genetics nature biotechnology and on top of that we also developed several molecular breeding lines and i am very happy as dr malotra also mentioned that under the leadership of dr n p singh as a director of iapr and dr g p dikshit as a coordinator of all india coordinated research project on chickpea india released two molecular breeding varieties last year one for fujiram wilt resistant one for drought tolerant and uh, dr malotra highlighted the uh, role of pulses for nutrition and i am also very pleased to mention that dr singh together with his team and icr and ministry of agriculture he made immense contribution to enhance pulses production and this reached for more than 20 million tons that brought self sufficiency in pulses in india and many of us we call him dalhan kranti janak so with these words i would like to thank you dr singh for joining us and would like to give this mic to you so i would like to request you to give your remarks and then to introduce dr dehki so please dr singh i am audible rajiv yes sir very well very good morning and uh, i am happy to see many of the you know star wars uh, my friend dr kiran sharma dr kalia dr malhotra and uh, many of the colleagues you know and it's very good initiative you know by every set to organize this web may you know on a very important topics genomics for food health and security nutritional security friends uh, we are all living you know in covid 19 pandemic many of you will be working from the home many people like me dr sharma are fire fighting to get you know important breeding material and uh, you know the germ plasm in the gene bank and also managing you know the research establishments friends uh, uh, it's matter of great pleasure that uh, this particular conference you know when they is uh, uh, organized okay it's organized at a time when we are working you know we are having a very different style of working and this particular time provided us opportunity to connect with each other and to listen and what the people have been doing in the background you know in the speech uh, dr malhotra well said that while the india is approaching the self sufficiency in pulses the same approach is now adopted in case of pile seeds and uh, it's a great challenge how i look at the genomics you know the genomics is not only you know a science having a very big potential to deliver but i look at you know the uh, science of genomics having a potential to modernize you know the our conventional plant breeding that brought us to a stage where we can say that we are you know self sufficient in food grains now including pulse in recent years and uh, how we look at you know the genomics that will not only accelerate the genetic uh, gain by making you know plant breeding protocol more efficient This, this will also attract a large number of people you know to work with the science of genomics friends uh, i have gone through you know the different lectures that is being organized you know through web in this particular webinar and i see everything you know from wheat to rice which are very important you know for security and again you know millets and again you know pulses iron seeds we have ports from all over the world i will not take much time we have two very you know eminent speaker i would like to speak and i i want admin to focus them you know in the background so that let people see rajiv can you do friends so the very first speaker is uh, lee hiki 
you all know Uli Hiki is a very eminent plant breeder and a crop geneticist. He works presently with the University of Queensland. He leads an innovative team conducting discovery and applied research on Australia's most important cereal crops, wheat and barley. This includes the understanding of genetics of the key traits like drought, adaptation to disease resistance, and apart from that, the development of novel technology to assist plant breeders. Dr. Hickey has played a very pivotal role in the integration of leading age plant breeding techniques such as the rapid generation advancement, speed breeding, genomic selection, and genome editing. His advice for the speed breeding crops is sought internationally, and uh, this technology is now well adapted by the plant breeders all over the world. And uh, besides that, he is involved you know, in uh, developing a very large number of variety in different crops. And uh, the kind of information which was given to me, he has published in date more than 60 research paper and referred journals, including the articles in the very high profile journals like Nature Plants, Nature Protocols, and Nature Biotechnology. With this introduction, I invite Dr. Lee Hicking to make the presentation. Dr. Lee Hicking. Can you connect, Rajiv? Yes, yes, Dr. Hickey is connected and he will be sharing a screen. Welcome, Lee. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor N.P. Singh, for that very nice introduction. It's, it's great to be here. Um, and, and thank you, Rajiv, for organizing this wonderful event. I, I hear that there's up to 3,000 people uh, listening, so this is fantastic and, um, you know, great initiative to, to have when people are at home and during this uh, coronavirus uh, situation. So thanks a lot. I'll just work on sharing my screen. Great. Okay, well, uh, yeah, it, thank you very much, everyone, for joining uh, all around the world, wherever you are. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, and I, I really, uh, I think it's a great opportunity to share some of our research and uh, um, on developing breeding technologies uh, that can really uh, help to accelerate uh, genetic gain uh, in our crop improvement programs uh, that's so critical for feeding uh, the growing population. To kick things off, uh, I would like to uh, start by playing a, uh, a short video. Well, the world population is still growing. By 2050, we'll have something like 10 billion people on this planet. So it means we've got to produce more food but we've got to produce more food under climate change. In Australia, we're facing one of the worst droughts we've ever seen. Farmers in Europe on the other side of the planet are also dealing with drought and heat. So we really need to speed up the development of more productive crops in the face of climate change. Plant scientists and breeders all around the world are working on discovering new traits and genes for drought adaptation or heat tolerance that can be deployed in future varieties. The problem is, it just takes so long to put those traits into varieties for farmers to grow. So speed breeding can really help fast track this process and deliver more robust crops to farmers sooner rather than later. Normally this technology can be quite expensive to set up large scale facilities. Uh, so we wanted to empower the plant scientists with a small budget. Our latest research paper uh, between the University of Queensland and the John Innes Centre in the UK, we've reported uh, the protocols on how to build your own uh, speed breeding cabinet or DIY speed breeding. We've also built a miniature desktop uh, cabinet uh, with um, bits and pieces that we got off the internet. It was very cheap, it only cost seven or eight hundred pounds and this tiny little cabinet now allows us to uh, trial uh, a new crop or a new cultivar of a crop and, and look at a new trait and once we've optimized the parameters we can then scale it up in the glass house. We're hearing more and more from institutes around the world establishing speed breeding facilities to help speed up their plant research or breeding uh, and yeah, we're pretty excited that Maybe one day speed breeding will really deliver 
some of our future varieties for our farmers. Okay, well, so uh, just similar to my background, uh, you're looking at uh, one of our speed breeding uh, facilities at the University of Queensland, uh, fitted out with the latest uh, LED lighting systems and temperature control uh, to achieve rapid generation advance. And we use this facility for growing up to six generations a year uh, for all of our wheat and barley uh, pre-breeding research and breeding activities uh, with industry. Firstly, though, just to provide a bit of background about this bee breeding technology, uh, our, some of our inspiration really came from uh, early research done back in the 80s. Um, and that was done uh, through Utah State University. It was funded by NASA. And they were trying to grow wheat in outer space. Um, some of the experiments they performed uh, were using constant light and control temperature to accelerate plant development. And so they could grow a very fast crop of wheat. And this video that's on loop is actually uh, the first video released of wheat growing on the International Space Station using this approach. Um, so back in 2003, my colleagues at the University of Queensland thought, well, hey, you know, this could be a pretty cool idea to, to speed up plant breeding and research on Earth. And so they first started applying this to, to plant breeding at the University of Queensland. So you can see uh, it's, it's not uh, a new technology. It's been around for some time. Um, and, and in fact, um, however, in recent years, it's, it's really uh, sparked a lot of interest and in how to actually apply speed breeding in, in research and crop improvement programs. Um, and in fact, over a 12 month period, I received uh, requests from hundreds of scientists and plant breeders uh, around the world. Um, and so this really motivated us to team up with other researchers around the world that had also developed uh, similar techniques and to make all this information available. Um, certainly, you know, companies, uh, plant breeding companies had developed their own protocols in house, uh, but you know, that information wasn't readily available. Um, so what we did is we teamed up with the University of Sydney and the Joiner Centre to publish these protocols for the first time um, in 2018. And it featured on the cover of Nature Plants, which was fantastic uh, exposure for this sort of breeding tool. Um, and before I go any further, I have to really acknowledge uh, some of the key people involved, uh, that being the, the, the two co-first co authors of the paper, uh, pulling all this together was Amy Watson and Shreya Ghosh. And of course, the brains behind setting up speed breeding in the Joint Inner Centre in the UK was Brando Wolf working with all of his colleagues there. So in a nutshell, um, this is what you can do when it comes to uh, speed breeding uh, wheat. And so you can grow six generations a year compared to just two or three in a regular glass house. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the number of generations you can achieve in a regular glass house is really variable. You know, two or three, it depends on the time of sowing, the season, because the photo period is variable and the temperature control is also variable. Um, the protocol we're running for uh, spring wheat is 22 degrees during the daytime hours of uh, where the plants are exposed to 22 hours of light, uh, but we're nice to them. We, we give them two hours of rest uh, in the dark phase uh, each day. And during those two hours of night, uh, the plants are experiencing a slightly cooler temperature of 17 degrees. And just to show how fast these plants uh, actually grow, because you know, seeing is believing, right? Um, we captured this beautiful uh, time lapse. Uh, it, it, well, our collaborators did, in fact, at, at the Earlham Institute. Um, and so here you can see, you know, speed breeding uh, wheat on the left and normal con glasshouse conditions on the right. And the speed breeding plants have already flowered. They're filling grain, approaching maturity, and it's harvest time. Uh, compared to the normal conditions, it's far too slow, and we don't have time uh, to finish the video, unfortunately. So this protocol that was you know, uh, initially uh, developed for wheat you know, it, it actually works for a lot of species, 
a lot of long day and day neutral species that are very important. And we showed this really nicely in the Nature Plants paper um, that it can be applied to durum wheat, barley, chickpea, oat, canola, pea, quinoa, and even grass pea, and some model species that are really important for our plant research, like Brachypodium and Madicago. And this, these visuals here you're looking at, it, I think really sums up you know, uh, the, 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 rate, the effect of speed breeding on rate of development. Across the board, we're talking, you know, if, if I was to put a number on it, it's really uh, accelerating uh, development uh, by double. Um, so these plants were uh, so on at the same time under speed breeding conditions on the left, regular glasshouse conditions on the right, uh, and photos captured between three and four weeks after growth. So really dramatic differences. Um, but the list is growing. You know, th now that we've published and made all this information available, uh, and the, it's been communicated widely, people are trying this for their favorite crop. And so it works now for peanuts, uh, lentils, uh, potatoes, uh, and the list is growing. In a follow-up publication, uh, we, we, we published a step-by-step -step guide uh, to actually set up speed breeding facilities. Uh, and this was in Nature Protocols, and it was a really, it was a mammoth task to pull together all this information. It really is a guide, even if your uh, favorite crop is not featured, um, we've highlighted the key aspects that you need to think about when it comes to optimizing and deploying this technology. Um, and a lot of troubleshooting, hints, tips, uh, etc. So this is, what you're looking at there is the bird's eye view of the uh, speed breeding facility at the John Innes Center. So they're very large scale facility indeed. But of course, this uh, technology can also be uh, deployed at a small scale. And uh, thanks to this very innovative group of early career researchers at the John Innes Center, they came up with this remarkable way to build your own uh, cabinet for speed breeding. And, and so at around a cost of uh, 1,000 US dollars, you can order bits and pieces of the internet uh, and build this fully programmable uh, uh, speed breeding cabinet. And, and so you can program uh, your lighting regime, temperatures, et cetera. So really good for plant researchers with a small budget and, and can really help accelerate uh, transgenic or pre-breeding research. Um, and so we had the pleasure of being involved in a speed breeding workshop uh, in Kenya, where uh, the guys at the John Innes Center uh, actually um, walked the participants through building their own cabinets. Uh, from, from the very basic materials. And so here you can see the video uh, where they're opening it for the first time. And while this is a very small facility, um, uh, which is useful for some plant research, um, the participants really, uh, I think it was really valuable for them because we could really grasp, you know, what are the key elements we're talking about when, we're, uh, when it comes to applying and developing speed breeding protocols, like light, photo period, uh, temperature, nutrients, water, etc. And so you can really apply these concepts to um, deploy this technology at a really big scale. And so uh, a scale which would be needed for a large crop breeding program or a big research lab. And you're looking at uh, the setup that we have here at the UQ where we have uh, where we had existing glasshouse infrastructure and um, which is now fitted out with LED lighting systems and with our temperature control, we can achieve this rapid generation advance. All of the details uh, as to how our system is set up uh, at UQ and, and at the John Innes Center is all detailed uh, in that Nature Protocols paper. So it's a very good resource. And it's not the only way to set up these systems. Uh, this system is very flexible, um, um, but, but it's a good guide. When it comes to deploying this technology at a bigger scale for plant breeding, um, and particularly for single seed descent in breeding programs, I really like to think of this as trying to create plant factories. Uh, we wanna grow uh, as many plants as possible for as cheap as possible and the smallest space as possible uh, to really ultimately drive down the cost per plant. Uh, so we can generate very large uh, populations or numbers of plants. And so here's just an example for barley uh, growing at different densities and even when we grow barley at 1,000 plants per square meter, 
these plants still produce between six and 12 seeds, uh, which is more than enough for uh, single seed descent uh, in breeding programs. And so I'd like to uh, compare now some of the strategies for developing uh, inbred lines uh, while I'm on the topic of single seed descent. And so here you can see the traditional approach uh, where you go from crossing to and performing all the inbreeding all the way down to F6. Uh, and if you're only growing one generation a year in your preferred field season, it takes seven years, of course. And while this um, is not really common in a lot of breeding companies who are going much faster, this is still a reality for some uh, breeding programs that are, uh, uh, have limited resources or they're faced with, with biological constraints for their particular species. Um, when we think about shuttle breeding, uh, where we're essentially achieving two generations a year uh, by shuttling materials from location to location, it's simple math, isn't it? it you, you can do it in half the time. And this has been widespread for a lot of different crops around the world. Speed breeding, uh, you can do it a lot faster uh, is the main point. Uh, and depending on uh, uh, and depending on your species, uh, you know you're, you're really talking between four and six generations a year. Um, let's see. And so double haploids, uh, similar time frame. Um, and double haploids have had a huge uh, impact in plant breeding, uh, particularly when we think about crops like maize and uh, winter wheat. And of course, while they've been so impactful, uh, like any technology, um, they, they, they do have some drawbacks and limitations. And some of those in, are listed here. So um, of course, not all, double hap not all crops have double haploid systems that have been developed, but it, where they do apply, um, there is limited opportunity to perform early generation selection. You certainly get a lot lower recombination compared to um, going through each generation of selfing where you get additional recombination. Um, certainly the efficiency varies across germplasm and it can be quite laborious and expensive to set up uh, or outsource the service. And I know uh, some companies in Europe you know, are charging about 12 euros per double haploid line for wheat and about six euros uh, per double haploid line for barley. So that's just an example, but you can think about how these costs can really accumulate if you're trying to generate thousands of breeding lines in a, in a, in a program. So where does all this fit into the breeder's equation? Um, well, uh, of course, the breeder is always thinking about ways to improve efficiencies in the program and the upper components of the genetic gain equation, um, he or she is trying to increase generally. So talking about increasing selection intensity, uh, depending on population size, sele selection accuracy, and of course you need genetic variants uh, in order to make genetic gain. But of course, speed breeding, uh, in a similar way, shuttle breeding, uh, it, it impact comes into play at the denominator of the equation, that's the years per cycle, which can be a real powerful uh, part of the equation to start to tweak um, and can really lead to uh, a big uh, rate, big in increase in genetic gain. So what about short day species? Um, well, well, I, I dare say uh, uh, that, you know, we can speed breed any crop. It's just a matter of optimizing uh, the environmental conditions to achieve early flowering and rapid generation advance. And so uh, when we think about it, you know, I would really say that the, the, the two primary elements that, that we need to optimize are day length and uh, of course uh, temperature uh, for any species, but there are other aspects that, that can be, or factors that can be optimized and tweaked like light quality, um, or opportunity for early, early harvest of, of, and, and germination of seed, uh, nutrient delivery, et cetera. But this is a nice summary of the key aspects and um, uh, featuring in, in, in our review on speed breeding published in Nature Biotechnology. And so um, when it comes to short day crops, uh, I've been recently uh, been involved in, in developing speed breeding protocols uh, for some of these species uh, and uh, this has been through a project called uh, VISA, uh, which is 
um, which is uh, led by ICRASAT. It's to, and one of the objectives uh, is to actually establish uh, centralized speed breeding facilities to accelerate breeding pipelines for crops that are important to Asia and Africa. And that includes you know, short day crops like sorghum uh, and millet and pigeon pea. And so, uh, so you know, this, this really presented a challenge when we first started working on this. Uh, you can see Pooja there. Uh, she's also been running a lot of experiments and developing these protocols as part of this project, which is funded by uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And so over the last sort of 18 months, we've made really good progress. Um, we've developed protocols uh, quite successfully for these short day crops. It's still a work in progress. Uh, we hope to further optimize these protocols, but here's our preferred protocol at the moment for uh, sorghum and millet. Um, at, using this protocol, we can grow four generations of sorghum and five generations of millet. And you can see it looks very different to the protocol uh, used for wheat. So we're talking about short days, 10 hour light, 10 hour photo period, uh, and 14 hours dark, uh, because it's a short day species. And these conditions are needed to trigger early flowering um, and very warm tropical temperatures for these crops. So 35 degrees and 25 degrees for the night period. And so when it comes to scaling up these approaches, um, even for these uh, larger species, it, it can be done. And so here you can see millet, uh, a segregating population growing at a rate of 300 plants per square meter. Uh, and on the right, sorghum uh, growing at 600 plants per square meter. So very high uh, density. In fact, probably too high there for sorghum. Uh, we find that we're finding that about uh, 300 plants per square meter is, is a very good density for these crops uh, because most plants produce seed uh, every generation at that rate. But very good for applying single seed descent in breeding programs because it's really key to driving down uh, the cost per plant. Uh, when it comes to pigeon pea, uh, we published uh, uh, a nice article with uh, Icrasat reporting an um, early pod harvest technique that can be used to achieve four generations a year for pigeon pea. So really promising there, um, but we're still continuing to try to optimize protocols. So uh, can we optimize the photo period and wavelengths and temperature to push this even faster? And so this is our, uh, our current goal. You can see uh, pigeon pea growing there in the speed breeding system. And some of the plants and what they look like when we grow them under speed breeding. I wanted to highlight this paper um, that's just come out uh, in TAG, and this was a few weeks ago, uh, published by uh, an excellent group of researchers at the University of Hohenheim in Germany. Uh, really exciting stuff. They've published uh, protocols for speed breeding uh, soybean, uh, rice, and amaranth. And, and just like our research, they've found that the 10 hour photo period also works beautifully for these species. And in fact, uh, using this approach, they can grow five generations a year uh, for soybean, for example. And so here you can see some of the plants and, and they were actually growing under uh, different wavelength compositions. So they're actually testing different wavelengths and how these plants responded. And it was quite surprising results. So uh, here you can see that uh, if you expose uh, soybean plants to light that does not have far red in it, you can actually achieve uh, very robust, short, early flowering soybean plants. Really perfect or ideal for uh, rapid generation advance and growing at high density. However, in rice, it was, it was almost the opposite. Uh, by actually, by, by, by exposing the plants to far red light uh, was, was one of the, the key triggers to producing plants that could early flower and, and, and actually achieve rapid generation advance faster. So the wavelength compositions uh, are very specific to a species. And this really opens the door for a whole new uh, research field aiming to optimize protocols around wavelengths. And if we look at the breeding program and where all this fits in, well, I'm told that the researchers at Hohenheim developed this for, for soybean, a speed breeding system, because their winter nurseries failed a number of years. And so instead of growing three generations, uh, two winter nursery and one in the field in the main season, now they can grow five generations a year 
as part of their breeding operations. And this system, of course, is, is very compatible with genomics and marker-assisted selection and tracking key genes through the breeding process. Now I'd just like to touch on some uh, speed breeding facilities, uh, give some examples, uh, different setups around the world uh, and different crops. And hopefully this sparks some ideas about how you could maybe set up speed breeding if you haven't already at your institute. And I, I really have to uh, say thank you to the breeding companies uh, that, have, that have shared this information, these slides, uh, really thankful to them for being so open and sharing to, to inspire uh, adoption of this uh, technology. Um, the first one here you can see is speed breeding of spring wheat for the North American program uh, of BASF. Uh, and this slide was provided by David Bonnet. You can see it's essentially a speed breeding warehouse. I, I, I like to think of this as. Um, it's fully indoors. Um, they're growing uh, wheat populations on multiple levels. Uh, you can see there, um, very high density. Uh, they're capable of producing 100,000 SSDs um, a year um, through their breeding program. They have the capability of growing five generations a year, but based on the structure and organization of their breeding operations, they're only growing two or three. So you can see that even though you have the power to grow six or seven generations a year. You don't have to actually grow that many generations for this technology to be very useful. You need to fit it in with the other operations in the, in the, in the breeding program, particularly around field testing. While we're on the topic of wheat, this is another example, uh, this time in Ethiopia and very different uh, setup here we're talking about. So we're working with the, the, the Ethiopians in Kalumsa to develop the speed breeding uh, system there. They have existing glasshouse infrastructure and you can see some of the plans here where we're actually planning to install um, LEDs, upgrade the air conditioning systems. And so this speed breeding uh, facility will help support uh, their, their breeding operations. So really exciting. Uh, you can see my uh, PhD student there, uh, Zeri Hun. Um, so really exciting to take this sort of technology uh, and try to deploy it in, in somewhere like Ethiopia could be really uh, beneficial to, to their operation. Uh, my next example is, is uh, on a short day crop now on pearl millet. Uh, and I've actually had the pleasure of, of visiting this um, facility at Corteva uh, in India. And it's just a beautiful humming facility. It's, it's the whole breeding operations go through this speed breeding facility you can see. Uh, it's low cost infrastructure. It's a poly house design. Uh, blackout curtains that are automated to control the short day photo period all year round. And they grow four generations a year, um, a density of around 300 plants per square meter, automated irrigation, all fully barcoded, integrated with their marker platforms, etc. cetera. Um, and you know, what, when, I, when I ask them why, why did they change to this system, uh, it's essentially budget and costs. So it's much cheaper, to grow the plants in this system. It's faster, of course. Um, and you know, it's cheaper compared to growing the generations in the field uh, and having a very big team. So this is why they switched to this system. Um, here's, a, here's a picture showing um, actually the, 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 the new speed breeding facilities that uh, have just been developed. Uh, this is during construction at Icrasat, um, uh, just outside of Hyderabad. Um, and this is a part of the Avisa, obviously a visa project and, and, uh, and it's a collaboration with Corteva. Corteva have actually shared uh, the designs of a lot of their facilities, including the one we were just looking at. So what you can see here is almost like a replica of the Corteva setup. And, uh, and you know, it was just completed recently and opened by the DG at Icraset. So really exciting stuff. And I'll take you a walk, a walk inside now of the, some of those facilities. Uh, you're looking at um, actually a room that's set up for speed breeding chickpea, uh, where we have existing glasshouse infrastructure there on the Icrasat campus um, that has now been fitted out with the latest LEDs, uh, temperature control, um, and automated irrigation systems. So uh, really cool stuff. And uh, now we'll walk through the, um, the setup for the short day crops, sorghum and millet. You can see the blackout curtains are drawn. So it's really pitch black in there. Um, and 
you know, apparently this can house 50,000 uh, wheat or sorghum plants at once. Uh, so automated irrigation, you know, real beautiful setup and, and you know, really changing the way uh, breeding operations will work in the future. Another example now is uh, is to rice, and and I and I, I really wanted to highlight this uh, setup at Erie uh, because it highlights the flexibility in in how you can set up the speed breeding or RGA systems, and and so this example here, you can see that they they have they can do it in the glasshouse or they can do it in the field. In the glasshouse, uh, they can achieve you know three and a half to four generations a year, uh, compared to the field. It's a little slower. They can grow three generations a year, uh, but they prefer to go to the field uh, at the moment because it's a bit cheaper. It's actually about half the cost. So this is where it becomes complicated. Um, you know, is a trade-off between speed and cost. And, um, and this is something that we need to consider, particularly in large scale breeding programs. Um, it's, it's very important. Another example of a, of a field-based uh, setup uh, is chickpea. And this time flying back to the other side of the world, uh, it's Lebanon. And uh, this is a beautiful setup uh, at Akata. And uh, these slides are provided by Aladdin. And, and he's done really innovative stuff. So normally LEDs are expensive, right? Um, you know, the units that, are, that we use from Heliospectra are very good quality, but they are on the expensive side. Here you can see uh, a setup from at Akata that's he's allowed to source these LEDs from a local market and they cost about 30 US dollars each. Uh, and what we have as a result is a field based high throughput speed breeding setup, um, very, very low cost. So, really innovative stuff. Um, just to get your, uh, you're really thinking out of the box, uh, here's another idea. Um, uh, this is a speed breeding capsule and and this is from a, a review we published on the opportunities to you know, speed breed orphan crops that have really um, uh, haven't received much investment or, or um, in directed improvement. And so uh, here is an artist's impression that we came up with. Uh, what if we converted a, a shipping container to a speed breeding capsule and fitted it out with, you know, so you could fit it out with solar panels on the roof to supplement the energy supply um, you know, air conditioning, and, and this could support some of the breeding operations to fast track things. Well, while it seems so futuristic uh, and, and maybe you know, beyond reality, it's happening. And so here you can see um, the setup that uh, uh, Stuart Kemp has created in Victoria, Australia. Uh, I've been working closely with him to set this up and at a, mod at a very modest cost, uh, he's generated a shipping container speed breeding capsule and, and he's using it to breed uh, 12 different forage species as part of his program. But if we think about um, you know, a, another crop, uh, the same growing area could be used to produce 15,000 chickpea inbred lines in a single year. So small space, but a lot of lines uh, that you could, you could be testing in the field. I want to just highlight some examples on how you can use this sort of speed breeding approach um, to uh, in, in different applications. So the first one is uh, pre-breeding. Now we all know that plant breeding has been very successful in developing the crops that we grow today, um, uh, very productive crops. But you know, through the plant breeding process, uh, you know, it's certainly gone. The genetics have gone through a bottleneck, and we've lost a lot of diversity for. Um, other traits that are of interest. And so, um, you know, going back to gene banks to access valuable genes and traits is a priority in pre-breeding programs. Um, and of course, transferring these valuable genes and traits from land race materials that are very wild into modern cultivars is a very time consuming process, unfortunately, with lots of back crossing. And so, you know, when we think about how do we uh, transfer novel traits from wild materials into elite variety. Here's just an example. Um, you know, you can do that through back crossing and then through a couple of gene stacking steps, you know, but it takes lots of generations. Uh, we're talking, you know, eight generations. And if you did this, uh, this is just an example for barley. Um, you know, in the field, it would take eight years. You probably wouldn't do it in the field, to be honest. 
Um, if you did it in a regular glass house, which is pretty common, it'd still take four years. But if you did it in speed breeding um, and you fast track the generations, you could do it in 18, 12 to 18 months, depending on uh, your crop. And so this can really open up new gene pools and traits for all of our crops. We can do this much faster. And so yeah, this is one of the th activities that a lot of my team are working on. Uh, we're actually trying to mine new genes and traits from uh, the Vavilov wheat collection. And so mostly disease traits, uh, where my team is you know, understanding the genetics of these novel alleles, but also fast tracking their introduction into adapted materials for breeders to use. Another example on how this sort of approach or uh, concept can help accelerate uh, activities uh, is in genome editing or transgenics. We all know that you know, genome editing is shaping up as a powerful tool. It's really unlimited in terms of its applications, um, in terms of traits and crops, um, you know, really exciting technology. However, you know, there are a lot of uh, bottlenecks when it comes to plant breeding and doing and integrating this into a big scale breeding program. Um, you know, firstly, well, yeah, we need clone genes or gene targets, right? And thanks to a lot of fantastic, you know, plant research, we have a lot of uh, gene targets already, and that's fast becoming you know, less of an issue, uh, particularly because the technology around how we identify uh, these functional genes has really evolved in recent years with the technologies. Um, secondly, there are uh, lengthy passages through tissue culture is a real problem. It takes a long time. Uh, and of course, they this whole process requires specialized labs uh, to undertake this editing or transformation process. And of course, the process is quite limited to um, a small number of amenable uh, genotypes, which are generally non-elite. It's not the very best breeding lines, unfortunately. And so um, just to show uh, just a little bit how this, uh, these technologies can be integrated, uh, in our Nature Plants paper, we, uh, this is um, some of the results from there. Um, so here, you know, we have the standard transformation uh, pipeline for barley, where we're growing the barley plants from seed to immature embryos, we're transforming them, and then growing them on to obtain uh, T1 seed from those X plants. And so what we did is, in this paper, we grew uh, barley plants under speed breeding to rapidly obtain embryos for transformation, transformed them, and grew them under speed breeding conditions and regular glasshouse conditions. And you can see you know, the rate of developmental differences here. Uh, and what did this do? Well, it, it, it shrinks both ends of the breeding pipeline and ends up saving about three months on the standard protocol. So we've got to stop thinking about you know, these technologies in isolation. It, it, there's big opportunities to start integrating and fusing these tools and technologies. And so you know, what does all this mean? Well, for this situation, it means that you know, for CRISPR and genome editing, uh, approaches, we can, we can validate new traits faster, um, we can transfer these new traits into farmer's fields faster for where these technologies are available. Um, and of course, well, you know, like for a lot of academics, you know, publishing that nature paper faster is very important. So, uh, yeah. All right. So, we're, so to take this uh, whole concept a bit further, you know, what if we could, uh, you know, take CRISPR out of the lab? That's one of the major constraints, right? Doing all this in the lab, anything that goes in the lab is, is not the best from a plant breeding perspective. It really is a bottleneck. And, and so we got thinking um, with my colleague, uh, Ian Godwin, you know, what if we could, we could do this? And, and, and so here uh, you can see it, it's a summary of some of our concepts around how, how possibly could we integrate the latest uh, technologies and techniques to literally take genome editing out of the lab and do it within a speed breeding uh, glasshouse, for example. And so, you know, I, I don't have time to go into the details today, uh, but if you're interested in, in this technology and, and, you know, and some of the ideas, um, you can read a bit further in, in our review in Nature Biotechnology. But it's, a, it's also, it's a brainstorming thing, right? I mean, we, we really want the community, community to start thinking about how can we scale up this technology um, and you know, we're doing a little bit of work in this space, but um, you know, really we, we need the community to, to, to work on this 
and, and, and really take this to a whole new level and transform you know, genome editing from a biotechnology into a high efficient breeding technology. Lastly, I want to talk a bit about um, the opportunities to integrate genomic selection and speed breeding. Uh, here's just a visual representation of the breeding cycle. Uh, you can see going from crossing, to the inbreeding phase, testing in the field for yield and quality disease traits, and releasing varieties. But of course, once you've generated data on selection candidates, you can select the best and perform the next cycle of crossing. Now, genomic selection, you know, it's, it's pretty good. You can avoid uh, the need for testing in the field to select the best parents for the next crossing cycle. But you don't really get out of testing. This still goes on. Um, you've still got to do the testing to identify the best uh, lines among the pack and the winners that go on to become varieties. But it's also important for generating data that is essential to retrain your algorithms and the genomic prediction uh, framework. Um, what happens when we introduce speed breeding into the equation? Well, you can crank these breeding cycles much, much faster, right? You can do the inbreeding faster. Um, and so we wanted to look at what's the potential of doing this in a breeding uh, program. So we teamed up with CIMIT researchers um, and to using real wheat data sets and breeding schemes, we performed uh, a series of simulations. And so to cut to the chase, well, uh, here's the result. After 30 years of breeding, uh, here we have the conventional breeding approach versus speed GS, which combines the two technologies. And you can see really translating to much higher rates of genetic gain. Um, and Kai, my colleague, uh, did for some fun, he, he did some sums and he worked out that varieties coming from the speed GS program were capable of yielding more than a half a ton of grain extra uh, per hectare. And that would translate to an extra thousand loaves of, of bread per hectare. So, you know, we're talking about feeding the world, but, you know, I think this is a great uh, example of how we can integrate technologies um, to develop high yielding, more productive uh, crop varieties. And so we're not just simulating these things, um, you know, we need to get our hands dirty and do this for in, in, the, in the real world. And, and that's exactly what Amy Watson was doing as part of her PhD. Um, uh, she was, she's here standing in the field of the first uh, wheat lines developed using speed GS approach. Uh, so as you see, she's really proud. Um, we did some, uh, you know, it was really exciting cutting edge research. Uh, however, you know, it, we're limited in terms of our capacity to really fully validate these technologies working in a university system. You know, we can only do so many yield trials, uh, et cetera. So it really makes sense to team up with industry um, to, to validate these breeding approaches and technologies. And so here is exactly what we're doing. Um, working with long reach plant breeders is a company in Australia. Uh, we're implementing speed GS and uh, here's the brains behind the operations. It's Kai Vosfels and uh, Ben Hayes. Um, and, and, you know, working with these guys, they're not happy with just doing the regular genomic selection. They're really taking it to the next level. Um, and so we're using software and algorithms that they've written, uh, which are a form of or branch of artificial intelligence, which is really guiding the crossing process. It's telling us which crosses are the best ones to make that bring together the complementary blocks in the genome in the shortest time frame possible. And all of this, of course, is in the speed breeding system. So it's, it's really, um, if, this, if we can demonstrate the efficiencies in this process, I think it's really gonna change the way um, you know, we, we breed crops. So it's really exciting. And I think hopefully it's, it's translatable across crops. And, and so we were starting to work with uh, Rajiv Varshni's team uh, on chickpea using very similar approaches and testing these systems. So just summing up, um, I'd like to just provide this overview. So uh, here we have our uh, traditional breeding approach with the different phases. So we have the crossing and inbreeding phase. Um, and this all depends on how fast you're going, which technology you're using, uh, what crop you're working on. Um, but of course, then we have a testing phase um, across many locations in your target environment for yield, uh, also disease, quality, etc. And then once you find the winner among the pack, you're increasing these and making them available as new varieties for farmers to grow. 
here's what happens when we introduce speed breeding into the equation. Uh, we can really crimp this whole crossing and inbreeding phase down to one to two years, depending on the, on the crop and, and, and facility that you have for speed breeding. Um, so big potential to increase the rate of genetic gain. Um, of course, here's where the breeding cycle uh, is cycling back. After a, uh, a couple of years of testing, you can start to choose parents, which, be, which starts the next cycle. And here's what happens when you introduce bee breeding and genomic selection. Uh, of course, you don't have to do the testing to start the next cycle. Uh, um, so this is where the, the shortening of the breeding cycle uh, is really benefited by the two technologies, very complementary, uh, almost made for each other uh, in, in my view. And of course, if you're going to start integrating, um, you know, uh, express edit technology or CRISPR, like I mentioned, this could be happening uh, in the crossing block on your key parents for key targets. Um, and I know that a lot of researchers are really experimenting with ways which we can avoid this whole inbreeding process and uh, do genomic selection on early generations and avoid inbreeding. So, so a lot, really uh, an exciting space to be working as a crop researcher. So some take home messages. Um, uh, hope you can see that speed breeding systems can be developed for any crop. Um, it's just a matter of optimizing the conditions uh, for that species. And there's applications across discovery research, uh, pre-breeding and breeding activities. Speed breeding platforms are common in the private sector. And you know, we, 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 we really got to try to work out uh, innovative ways to deploy this type of approaches in the public systems uh, around the world. And for crops that haven't, uh, don't receive as much funding, of course. And so one of the ways that is critical, uh, or one of the, some of the things that are critical to do this um, is low cost infrastructure, streamlining operations, reducing the costs of these technologies is really critical. Um, there's really good opportunities to integrate technologies. Like I said, let's, start, let's stop thinking about these technologies in isolation and start to integrate them. Um, really good opportunities and you can, you can see, imagine it would be very easy to integrate marker assisted selection into the speed breeding process. Um, you know, integrating it with genomic selection, I think is a perfect match, but it does come with its challenges. Just setting up genomic selection in crop breeding programs is challenging. Um, if you don't have the data, you're data organized, you know, in databases and, and everything else. So um, it's definitely an advanced technology, um, but you know, uh, I think these things can come together and they can lead to big genetic gain. I want to thank, um, you know, almost a small army of people uh, from around the world that have really contributed to the development of our speed breeding protocols and breeding technologies. Um, thank you also to our funding bodies, uh, particularly the Australian government, the ARC and the GRDC, uh, who've been really supportive of my team uh, and all the students in my team. Uh, thank you very much. And that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Dr. Dr. Lee. Am I audible? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. perfectly. Yes, sir. Cool. You are very excellent presentation. You know, it was not only very rich by the content, but it was very excellently delivered. And uh, speed breeding, which you initiated, you know, couple of years back, in one or two species, now it can be reproduced. You know, on more than a, a dozen species, whether they are the short day length crop, long day length crop, photo thermal sensitive crop, or Photothermal insensitive crop, C3 plant or C4 plant. Now, you also said very nicely, you know, that how this can be very well connected to our normal breeding protocol and to this can be combined well with the transgenic research and, you know, gene editing research. Thank you very much once again, and I understand everybody enjoyed your talk as ever. Thanks. Yeah. Thank, thanks you very much. Thank you. Dr. Singh, yeah. we are having a few questions and what I would suggest if you allow, I can uh, read some questions from the chat box because there are many questions and we can ask Lee 
to yeah. answer a few question maybe for 10 minutes session and then after that we will go for the next okay that's okay, okay. good thank you so lee there are large number of questions and many of them they have appreciated your presentation they are grateful to you for your time a very part this frequent as uh, frequently asked question is what is the impact of the speed breeding on nutrition so have you checked about these things yeah um it's a good question of, often comes up um well you know it, we haven't really looked at this um you know it it, it could possibly uh, be leading to higher rates of mutation. Um, and I say that because, you know, certainly the plants are more stressed. It, it's, it's a very, um, you know, unnatural system to grow them so quickly. Um, we know that, you know, rates of recombination increase when plants are grown under, slight, under warmer conditions. Um, so it's possible that we, we might have uh, added benefits when it comes to uh, recombination and mutation rates. Um, okay. This would be would be would be advantageous in in my opinion. Good. Other question is, and I will select uh, folks few questions because we cannot uh, have all these questions. You can ask those questions to leave by email or Twitter. But a few questions. What about revising this your strategy to speed shuttle breeding? So this means that one advancement in the field conditions after every two advancement by speed breeding, as adaptive traits matter. Yeah, that, that, that's right. So one of the um, main, main well, one of the advantages of the shuttle breeding is that uh, you know that plant breeders can can simultaneously select for adaptation or adaptive traits. Unfortunately, you're very limited to do that in a speed breeding system. You you, you would have to apply selection for these sorts of traits um, at the end once you've got inbreds. Um, alternatively, if you've got good markers for key genes and traits. You can you can select for them along the way during line development, but you're right. That's that's one of the uh, trade-offs you have to think about when it comes to uh, applying and deploying this sort of technology. Yeah. Okay. And another question, and they are referring about your Nature Biotech paper, and they say that in that paper you mentioned about CRISPR technology and crops using Gemini virus as vectors. It has been seen that these procedures often raise questions about the long-term effect of these artificially engineered crops on human health, how do you think that they can help to address such issues and concerns? Uh, sorry, Rajiv, I'm, I didn't quite catch that. Well, I think this is more related to the GM related crop that in that your paper you talked about GM. So this person is more interested to see addressing the concerns what we have from the GM. And I think, yeah, so this is. Yeah, well, you know, um, I, I think uh, the consensus on GM technology from the plant science community um, is that the technology is safe. Uh, and, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, um, you know, the, 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 a lot of consumers, um, you know, they, they, they don't like GM technology. And um, so there's a lot of misconceptions about the safety of the technology. This is a, this is a, I see this as a problem, you know, for, for plant science, um, we've got to be, uh, we're going to be advocating for uh, science-driven decisions when it comes to policies around uh, GM crops. And I think we'd be very useful to have GM technology in the toolkit for yeah. crop improvement. Yeah. I'm also taking a few questions from the YouTube and your presentation was watched by more than 2,000 people. Maybe, well, more, yeah. So a few questions from this YouTube. So some people ask that, hey, do you have any idea about the epigenetic changes during speed breeding? Uh, short answers, uh, no. Um, uh, we, we do hope to explore this, uh, but, you know, um, it, it, it's, it's possible uh, that, that changes are occurring, epigenomic changes and, and even, you know, genome rearrangements uh, occur through a double haploid system. Um, so, you know, these sorts of changes uh, in more traditional breeding approaches uh, are, are common. Like we think about mutation breeding. Um, or, you know, like I said, all the double haploid process, um, you know, this is, this is a common thing for plant breeding. And, and I think while it's, it actually is worthwhile to study because we can learn a lot about what's happening in these sorts of systems. Um, it doesn't stop them being effective from a plant breeding perspective, as long as you're applying selection. Yeah. The other question is that uh, probably you mentioned about this uh, speed breeding cabinet. Some people asking, including my collaborator, Dr. Bhardwaj from Delhi, 
What is the cost of this speed breeding cabinets? Yeah, it's it's one thousand US dollars to assemble yourself, um, and I believe most of the bits and pieces you can order off Amazon.com. Um, but you know, it, again, that that's uh, um, I think the the real uh, uh, important thing behind this is the concept, and and you know you you know the key elements you need to control. Um, it's a bit of phys physio uh, physics and biology to control the right conditions that you need to induce early flowering and generation advance in these crops or species. Um, you can take these principles and, 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 and come up with your own system and, and, and how you apply them in a, in a breeding or research program. Okay, it's one question. How many plants you can raise in this $1,000 cabinet? <laughs> Not, not many. It, it's very small. Yeah. So, so, so you look, if you're a small researcher and you, you're really focused on a, on a few plants uh, for back crossing or transgenics, I think it'd be useful in that regard. Or actually, I know a lot of people are using it to uh, trial speed breeding protocols. So before they then go and design a very big facility. Yeah, it's useful for this too. What is the speed of breeding? Can well, they're asking that whether speed breeding can induce the mutation also during this uh, ad generation advances. Um, well, every generation that you grow of a plant, uh, you have mutations. Um, is it increasing in speed breeding? Um, look, my guess is it, it could be. Uh, is that beneficial, or would it have a negative effect? Uh, well, I, I, I think it's, it's, it could be beneficial as long as you're applying selection. Uh, and, and, that, and all plant breeding programs apply selection when you get to the field. So uh, you just throw out anything that has a deleterious mutation. And uh, the other question is whether is speed breeding applicable to plant cell suspension, plant cell suspension culture? And then related to other one that can tree species be benefited from the speed breeding protocol? Um, do you mean integrating double haploids with speed breeding? Is that what the question is? Uh, not very clear, but uh, yeah, so you can answer on that aspect as well, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> oh, was it the macrospora technique, is it? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I, look, I, I know there's groups in Australia um, that are already integrating these sort of speed breeding approaches with uh, double haploid systems. So, uh, you know, again, a great example of combining the, the, the tools. Um, why not? Um, you know, any, any sort of part of the process where we're just waiting for plants to grow can be optimized and sped up, um, definitely. Okay. And, uh, well, I think uh, I am just going through so several questions. What is the impact of the, on the genotype of crops developed by speed breeding? Have you seen some ex changes in the gene expression or uh, some different kind of behavior of the plants raised by the speed breeding? Um, no, we haven't. We've we found that, you know, seed produced in a speed breeding system um, is just as uh, vigorous and fit uh, the next generation. Um, uh, we've tested this, we've reported this in the papers. Uh, in terms of gene expression, it's not something we've looked at. Probably gene expression is a bit different because it's a different environment compared to the field. Um, but this is just a plant breeding tool to yeah. advance generations. Yeah. This question has come again. What is the probability of success of speed breeding on tree crops, fruit tree, those, yeah, perennial crop, like, yeah. Tree, tree, tree crops. crops. Yeah. Okay, yeah, well, it's, it's uh, I think it's very promising. I think, so one of the things that really got me thinking about this was a group in New York who work on American chestnut trees. And, and, and there, it's a native species, it's get under attack from a, uh, a fungus, and so they're trying to breed resistance into the population. And, and it takes many, many years for the American chestnut tree to flower. And what they worked out was, you expose these plants to a high intensity light, you can get them to flower in just 12 months. So when I heard about this work, I thought, look, you can speed breed any species. Uh, and, and so now we've got projects working on developing systems for speed breeding banana. Um, yep. We're talking about avocado. Uh, look, I think the horticultural crops could really benefit from these sorts of uh, systems. Uh, I know they already have some uh, protocols that use hormones and things like this, uh, but I think integrating these tools again, um, we, can, we can take this approach to other species and crops.
Okay, we will take one more, two question. One is different people they are asking this question related to their crowd. What is that speed breeding? Whether you have protocol in mulberry, sugar cane. So whosoever is working on those crops, they are mentioning name. And uh, second question is that uh, basically, mm, yeah, I think this is the people are asking about their crops basically that different crops yeah, well, and these different yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's um look it, it, if your crop is not in the protocols that were published already or or other colleagues or researchers have published, um you know if you if you're in doubt, drop me an email. Um, I can I can point you in the right direction or to the group that might have worked on your crop. Um, and if, and if you know, there's no protocol available, you, you just have to start doing some 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 trials yourself and test these things. Test the key parameters first, so temperature, photo period. Um, and you can optimize these protocols pretty quickly uh, by, by adopting that sort of stepwise approach by testing okay. different parameters. Yeah. Good. So we had a lot of questions and I think uh, we cannot answer all the questions, but some people ask about your presentation, whether this will be available. And I already took permission from Lee yesterday. Yeah. So I think that this presentation will be available on the YouTube in public domain. You can watch this thing yeah. any number of time. And also, Lee has been also kind that uh, you can also ask your question to him by email. With these yeah. things, we would like to thank you, Lee, once again for great presentation. 